Good evening, colleagues. Thank you very much for joining us in this webcast. We are very pleased that you are standing with us at this time. We recognize that the death of George Floyd in the US has really provoked all kinds of feelings across the world around anti-racism and injustice broadly. And we stand at an important place in our history as individuals, as individual nation states. And we are saying today, as we have been saying for the last week, that we are intolerant towards inequity and uh, this launch of educational equity services is a recognition of that intolerance. Equity cannot wait. We already know that equality means giving everyone the same resources, but equity means giving each person access to the resources they need to survive and thrive. Equity focuses on closing achievement and opportunity gaps and fighting implicit bias. Equity means recognizing that power imbalances exist within historical and contemporary contexts of race, ability, gender, sexual orientation, financial background, upbringing, etc. And accounting for these differences in order to improve the education and the daily life of the maximum number of students. This means accounting for and better supporting individual differences because some students do need extra attention or allowances to overcome setbacks in their personal life and or in their longstanding systems of oppression. Rules such as blanket punishment for tardiness or absence or equal one-on-one -on -one time with a teacher can be inequitable when taking into account students' potential individual reasons for needing extra support, for example. Meanwhile, practices like dress codes, including hairstyle, that present a double standard based on race, gender, or body type can, by definition, be discriminatory. It is important to establish equity as a consistent annual goal and to hire teachers, lecturers, managers who come from diverse backgrounds and are able to relate to and work with all types of students and clients. When equity is part of an organization's mission and strategic plan, it becomes easier to brainstorm, share, and unravel its many layers. Equity involves giving a voice to marginalized groups or individuals. This means allowing discussion, dissent, or even anger to be expressed. While one person may feel briefly uncomfortable while confronting their privilege, another has felt excluded, unheard, unsafe, judged, or even objectified in minor or major ways for years, if not decades. Fighting for equity does not mean just representing minority voices, but holding the door open for adults and students to advocate for themselves and to relate their own experiences. It means diving into self-reflection and nuance society's issues in order to offer solutions that outpace well-meaning but ultimately unhelpful statements such as I don't see race or gender, or LGBTQI students don't need special treatments because gay marriage is legal, we're all the same, or we don't need feminism because women have equal rights. Leadership then for equity is grounded in action. Leaders for equity stand for others, demonstrate courage and take risks to forge improvement. That is why Educational Equity Services was formed to work with educational institutions 
from nursery to university to undertake case study research of equity concerns and good practice to develop capacity through training and to provide institutional support through a range of audits and evidence-led intervention. Today, we are very pleased to be joined by four distinguished speakers, Dr. Asima Iqbal, who will speak to us on the topic of religion and educational leadership. Dr. Anna Carlyle, who will speak to us on the topic of LGBTQ inclusive educational leadership. Dr. Denise Miller, who will speak to us about black British women in children and young people services. And Dr. Ponsu Marusi, who will speak to us about gender and educational leadership. I will not take up much more for your time, but I will now introduce Dr. Asima Iqbal, who will present to us. Dr. Asima Iqbal presently works at CU Coventry as a lecturer, and her role includes developing key academic skills in undergraduate science students. For her doctoral research, Dr. Iqbal examined Pakistani, in particular Muslim head teachers' perception of their religion in their role as school leaders. This comparative education study between Pakistan and England showed lots of cultural differences between the two countries in terms of how religion played a role in the life of educational leaders. Colleagues, to kick us off this conversation, Dr. Asima Iqbal. Thank you, Paul, for the introduction. Uh, uh, so Paul has already introduced me. I'll not wait any time on uh, introducing. I'll just share my screen. So bear me with me for just a second. Um, OK, so. Um, my research, as uh, Paul has just described, my focus and my research interests lie in religion and educational leadership. And uh, I was interested in, so while exploring the notion of equity in education, which is today's uh, the topic of today's session, uh, I will be looking at religion and how it plays out in a leadership role with some, while I will be sharing some key findings uh, from my own uh, doctoral study. Uh, while the focus of my religion, uh, well, the focus on was on my on the religion of the head teachers who were the key participants of my research, I came across multiple factors that uh, interplayed to influence how religion, uh, how the head teachers experienced their religion in a professional role. Um, so while setting up the order of this presentation, brief presentation today, I was mindful that it uh, should be presented in a manner that, you know, it is going to be um, thought provoking for uh, the listeners, for the participants. And uh, I'm just going to focus and look at the inequities in education, which were highlighted by my own research and where there is a lot of other literature available as well, uh, which highlights the inequities, I would say, in uh, the education with a particular uh, focus and with a particular uh, emphasis on uh, the religion of the, of the people involved in the education leadership section, sector. Uh, I will then move on to explain the key findings of my research, again, highlighting how the statistics relate to the to the findings of my research and vice versa and how uh, in the end i'll be just sharing uh, some new developments whereby i found them quite interesting where i finished my research about two years ago in 2018 and uh, which where i thought that you know i had uh, literally uh, touched upon a, a something or a gap in literature where there was not much research going on on Muslim head teachers, particularly of the Pakistani origin, and where I my research informed the readers that uh, there is that small minority of uh, head teachers who are uh, who do come from that background, uh, but something that continues even today. And then there's some some latest developments that I will be sharing with you, and. Uh, concluding basically that you know there is a time 
that all the issues that were highlighted and all the findings that I found in my doctoral research need policy attention uh, now. So moving on, um, so equity in education, obviously Paul has talked quite in length about the equity in education, the definitions, the various dimensions of equity in education, and I will not go into too much detail for that. Uh, all I would just highlight is where we would, we have been talking about fairness and inclusion as, as uh, key aspects of equity in education. It is something that I uh, found in my research as well. Uh, in addition to the uh, to the two uh, contested terms which UNESCO uses as equity and equality, and again there are there are multiple uh, terms and terminologies that are used to describe these terms, but without going into their descriptions, uh, in whatever way these uh, these organizations are defining these terms, uh, when we think of the Black, Asian, and minority ethnic people, uh, we find that these key these areas are. Uh, are still problematic. Um, so there's this recent research that I came across uh, before I move on to talk about my own research. There is this recent study uh, report that was written for the Runnymede Trust, uh, Visible Minorities and Invisible Teachers. I have just picked up some key factor, uh, some key statistics from this uh, from this report, which I thought that uh, gave a very good perspective of my research, uh, which was obviously, as you can see, it was published in 2019, and uh, I did not have access to this report at the time I was writing my research. Uh, however, I did highlight this in my findings that, you know, if you look at this graph, uh, you can see that the uh, population of BME teachers, including the leadership roles, uh, is quite low as compared to their uh, white counterparts. Moreover, there was an, an, another interesting statistic that this uh, report has highlighted, which is the diversity gaps between the BME teachers and the BME pupils across the regions. Uh, this is, again, something that was a very interesting finding from my own research as well. And if now we look at the statistics, we can see my research, uh, just to give a little uh, background, so that my for my research, I uh, was looking at areas in the West Midlands and the Southeast of London. So you can see that, you know, whereas the percentage of BME pupils in West Midlands is 32%, uh, the percentage of BME teachers is only 9.7%. And we still don't know what percentage of these teachers are in a leadership position. And same as you can see um, in the London region, you can see it's south, east, southwest, the percentages are 21.1% for the students, whereas 4.3% for the, for the teachers from the BME background. Uh, this slide again, BME teacher representation in the local authority maintained primary and secondary school. Uh, as you, as I've just told you, that my focus was on the head teachers uh, in the uh, in the state maintained schools. Uh, I again, it, the, my first finding, and as you can see, is quite. Uh, evident from these statistics as well, that in the primary uh, maintained schools, the, the total population of ethnic groups was 14,500, and the BME representation was only 435, which is about 3% only. Whereas in the secondary maintained school, it is only 3.6%. And this is where I seriously had an issue in, to begin with in my research. I had that issue of underrepresentation of my, of the muslim head teachers so that was that is something that i would like to highlight uh, in today's uh, in today's presentation that it was the underrepresentation of uh, muslim head teachers specifically with the pakistani background that was an issue for me uh, to begin my research reason why i had to look at pakistani muslim head teachers was because i was doing a comparative research uh, between england and pakistan uh, so already there were uh, many variables considering the two different cultural and religious contexts of the two countries. Uh, so therefore, I had to limit myself in terms of the uh, ethnic group of these uh, head teachers. So therefore, I had to select Pakistani Muslim head teachers. Uh, so already Muslim, finding Muslim head teachers was a big task, but finding a Pakistani Muslim head teacher was an even bigger task. However, the, the five head teachers that I found were self-selected. I sent uh, emails to about 15 head teachers, and only five of them responded, and they were the participants of my uh, study. Uh, and this clearly goes to show 
uh, the rate of inclusion of these head teachers in the uh, in the leadership in the education leadership in England. Uh, not only that, uh, you know, by of of course after selecting and after uh, conducting detailed interviews with these head teachers, um, I found out that uh, these head teachers found what they experienced was that getting into the profession of education or teaching was not as difficult as it was moving up the ranks in the uh, in the teaching profession. And again, unfortunately, one of the biggest factor was their identity, which was not on not only their religious identity, but also their ethnic identity, which was them being Pakistani, Asian, Muslim head teachers. Uh, one of the head teachers, uh, I remember, clearly told me that, you know, he uh, called, he asked his friend to call uh, somebody somewhere where he had applied for a head teacher's position. Uh, the friend got an interview call, but he did not because of the name that he told over the phone to the to the person who was uh, taking their details. Uh, so there was, so yes, there is uh, that aspect of underrepresentation, and again, there are multiple factors uh, behind this underrepresentation. Uh, uh, not only that, obviously, because of the very low numbers, which I've just uh, shared again, coming from that Runnymede Trust, mm -hmm. uh, not only it is the uh, the background or the identity of these head teachers, which, are, which is a problem or which creates problem for these head teachers, it also leads to the lack of motivation for these uh, people or in the teaching professions to move up or to actually even aspire to become head teachers. Um, while this was the case of, uh, well, well, the religious identity, as I said, as, as Paul mentioned, played out quite differently in the two countries. And I really wanted to just touch a little bit upon the religious identity and its role in, uh, in an educational leadership position. Uh, so it was a very different form of uh, 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 underrepresentation that I found in the, uh, in the English head teachers. Uh, on the other hand, in the case of Pakistan, uh, unfortunately, religion again becomes a factor for discrimination when it comes to selecting head teachers in a state maintained school. And because uh, Muslims are a majority, whereas the small minority, which is the largest minority, is of Christians, there is a severe, again, a lack of uh, representation of those religious minorities in Pakistan. And that is, again, something which is an unfortunate. Uh, uh, unfortunate uh, fact about the Pakistani society, especially in the state maintained schools, uh, that religion is used, uh, that people or the people who are in the selecting or in the administration would not consider uh, people from minority uh, Christian backgrounds to be uh, taken up as head teachers of the schools. And again, there are multiple factors that play out in uh, the Pakistani societies, obviously, which we do not have uh, much time to talk about. Uh, but the bottom line or the key uh, takeaway from this was that religion as a discriminatory factor played a role in both the societies uh, differently in the in the context of England and differently in the context of uh, Pakistan. But coming back to the case of uh, England. As you can see in the slide, my last point I've mentioned is the Trojan horse controversy. Uh, this controversy started at the time that I started my research, which was April 2014. Um, and it was, and I was fortunate enough to uh, be able to interview all the five self selected head teachers because uh, they were not only they were determined, but also I was determined to interview them. Uh, but the Trojan horse controversy played a big role in. Uh, in basically inhibiting these people from coming into the profession and in playing and in just painting these head teachers as uh, coming from, you know, being regarded as either terrorists or extremists, the schools, the complete schools as well. Uh, so what the Trojan horse controversy, it was all based on a letter that was released and which, uh, which, um, which put allegations on some Muslim majority schools in Birmingham uh, that there was an Islamist agenda of taking over uh, the schools uh, in Birmingham. And therefore, there was a detailed inquiry that uh, went through and uh, a lot of head teachers were questioned. A lot of these schools were uh, shut down, were put into special measures. Uh, a lot of these schools uh, actually lost their rating in terms of the Ofsted. 
Uh, and unfortunately, the, the, and the underlying factor behind them was that there was some sort of uh, religious plot taking place in these schools. And the head teachers, the governors, and the senior administration and leadership were involved in this. Uh, the late, uh, later on, when the entire investigation was over, there was nothing found, but there was a serious uh, atmosphere of mistrust. Uh, that was created amongst the head teachers, whereby at, at some point they would refu they refuse to uh, uh, talk to me. They refuse to they they talk to me about things that they did not want to go, uh, you know, did not want to be recorded, and therefore the, all those issues again, which uh, led me to think that you know these these head teachers they were doing a really important job of leading schools, which were uh, which had a high population of. Uh, Muslim students or even Asian students, uh, but even then in their schools, and although they were not doing anything uh, too different from what they were expected to do in the position of a state school head teacher, even then uh, they were, uh, you know, put into the limelight and they were uh, questioned in different ways uh, for their uh, for their yes religious identity as well, and based on their religious identity, what exactly were they doing in their own schools? In terms of, I discussed earlier, um, in terms of the new developments in this area, um, although it started, this this uh, controversy started in 2014, went up till for a number of years. I finished my research in 2018, uh, but by when to in 2006, by 2015, uh, when I did a second round of interviews, the head teachers were much more confident. The head teachers had gone through a series of uh, interviews and uh, offset inspections. And they were much more confident to talk about it as opposed to 2014 when they were extremely afraid and scared. And I thought that, you know, and reading and following on all these uh, uh, reports and all these investigations, I thought that that thing was, uh, was over, uh, which was proven wrong. Uh, when in 2019, a friend of mine told me that there was a play going on by the name of Trojan Horse. The play was run across different cities. It was even run uh, in the parliament. It was the first played in the school, which was first accused of the Trojan horse plot. Uh, it was an extremely interesting play. Um, I'm not sure if they're running it even now, but I watched it the last one of the last shows in February. Uh, it, it presented the whole investigation, what happened, what the pupils went through, what the teachers went through. Uh, I really wanted to show a small video of the experiences of the students who participated in this play and the teachers. Um, I will not, um, I'm not sure if I have enough time for, uh, do I have enough time? Can, can someone tell me? No? Okay, so I think I might not have enough time. So I'll share the link of the video separately. Uh, but it was shocking to hear. Uh, it was shocking to hear the views of these uh, head teachers. Oh, sorry, these teachers who were involved and who were accused uh, during this Trojan horse controversy, and which made me think that the whole controversy is still not over. Uh, they were teachers. They were governors who were literally crying on the stage, uh, saying that their whole professional careers had have literally uh, are in a mess. They cannot join any school. Uh, they cannot even join any other profession for that matter. The students were literally devastated. And it was a, it was a very sad state that I experienced when I looked at the, when I watched the play and I heard those people uh, talking about uh, at the end of the play. So I will share the video link, uh, which you might uh, be able to uh, watch in uh, later on. My concluding remarks for the presentation was that uh, looking at, um, how religion, looking at the aspect of religion in these selected uh, head teachers, I believe that it is time to unpick the elements of the black, Asian, and minority ethnic uh, communities, uh, which are all individual. So unpick the elements of the B, either the acronym BME or the BAME, because they are all individual entities which have their own concerns and their own challenges. Uh, each category within this acronym has its own unique characteristics and which need serious attention, especially if we want to increase their representation in the education sector. 
the religious identity, I believe, of some members of the BAME community, especially the Muslims, needs individual attention to counter the rhetoric of extremism, terrorism, and Islamophobia, and which eventually results in their exclusion from the education sector. And if we are to reflect on the statistics that I showed you earlier, we can see that uh, the categories are being considered as one and we cannot, un as of right now, there is no way where we can unpick the religious identity and maybe do some further research on how the religious identity impacts uh, their inclusion, uh, the inclusion of these, uh, of the Muslim uh, head teachers in the education leadership uh, uh, in the edu uh, in the uh, education sector in England, uh, and therefore that is something that needs uh, attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Asima. Lots of um, complimentary comments are are coming through in in the in the live comments um, section. We we just have have time for for one quick question, Asima. And 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 um, what so you you mentioned a lot the, the Trojan horse um, um, issue, and is it that you are saying that that the, those head teachers um, were were showing a different kind of leadership, or uh, before they were they were um, under this investigation or coming out of this investigation they are showing a different kind of leadership. Uh, I don't think, Paul, that they were showing any different kind of leadership. They were just whatever uh, regular practices uh, were there in the schools, that is the thing that was questioned. So in particular, I mean, obviously, the schools that I uh, look, was looking at and I was the, my sample, uh, they were not part of the Trojan horse, uh, that, that uh, group of schools that were highlighted in the Trojan horse controversy. However, just because they had a large majority of Muslim students and they were being led by a Muslim head teacher, that is why the Ofsted teams uh, came back into these schools. And just to ask these he uh, head teachers about, uh, especially, for example, sessions going on in religious education, for example, uh, what is taught in these religious education uh, sessions, uh, who are the people teaching, and then at times, uh, obviously, the teachers in their, fo in their focus groups uh, would tell me that uh, Ofsted team members would be standing outside the classrooms and listening and watching uh, what was being taught. So it was more than the leadership, it was the entire uh, ethos in the school and the entire, uh, all the practices going on in the school that were uh, that were questioned. And within those was, for example, something like the head teachers would uh, make provisions for prayers, especially the Friday prayers. Uh, so that was something that was done in response to the large majority of Muslim uh, pupils and teachers. It was not a, it was not done anything outside of that. And they had multi-faith rooms, not in particular an Islamic faith room. Thank you, thank you very much. I think um, I agree with a lot of the comments in the in the section here, um, in particular from from um, uh, Professor Jackie Lumbe who is suggesting to us that religion is such an under-researched but yet such an important area in educational leadership and so i know your work asima and the work of dr saida shah at university of leicester is so critical and also dr shamim mia at the university of huddersfield so so thank you and well done